Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, this is Chris Gandy, uh, one of your hosts for uh, Advisor Today's podcast. Here we feature some of the top leaders in the insurance and financial services industry. Our guest today, Jamie Hopkins, we're going to get a chance to spend a little bit of time with him. We're at the National Leadership Conference here in Washington, D.C., where we will be here to focus our time, energy, and effort on trying to impact the laws that impact Main Street America. Um, as your national trustee, our co-host is not here today joining me, but uh, she's here in spirit, Suzanne Carawan. Um, she's actually participated in the National Leadership Conference, and she's she's very integral to making sure that that go off, goes off at a, a very, very, very smooth pace. So with that being said, I'll represent her and I today. Uh, today, we don't have a sponsor. Our sponsor will be the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. And next year, we hope to see you um, here at the National Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C. With no further ado, uh, I'm I'm honored to have one of the the wonderful guests, also a, a, a trustee, a, mm-hmm. a trustee similar to myself, who serves NAFA and represents everyone out there in the marketplace. So we get a chance to interview Jamie Hopkins, and uh, this is a long time coming. Jamie uh, Jamie joined the board last year as a, an advocate, and now we get a chance to have a conversation with Jamie, get to know Jamie a little bit. Get to know one of the reasons. Uh, what are some of the reasons why he joined NAFA and and continues to add value? And those of you who don't know Jamie, Jamie is, is has been a um, a staple in the financial services industry and and in the insurance industry, and is here to help us learn a little bit about where the industry is going, how to find freedom, and, yeah. and some of the <laughs> some of the aspects of of what's happening uh, in your world, and and kind of as you kind of make your way through NAFA. What are you seeing, observing, and then things that you would look to or advice you would give people as we go through neighbors? So with that being said, we're going to have some, have a little bit of fun today. So Jamie, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing awful, man. Just <laughs> awful. You know why? I thought I was going to get the better of the two co-hosts on the show. And, you know, Suzanne's actually got to make sure everything runs out there. Right. And so, but no, it's amazing to be here. I love, I love, uh, you know, DC is a beautiful place. You know, I grew up, you know, just North of here and, uh, National Leadership Conference been great so far, as you said, like, what do you get the the takeaways of it? But I mean, being involved in the political side, the advocacy side is what NAFA does better than anybody else out there. Mm-hmm. And it's huge. Like, I know people don't love politics a lot of times, but it's so important. As you mentioned going in, like, these are the laws that shape our businesses and then how we get to serve people. Yeah. You know, I started off in political consulting and, you know, it's a tough area, but it's so important. It drives the country. It drives the world. That's a huge part of what we do here in NAFA. Yeah, exactly. So, Jamie, we like to take a journey. So let's let's rewind the tape. Let's rewind the tape backwards. And, and Jamie, let's talk a little bit about how did you start in the industry? I mean, how did you get your feet wet? I mean, what are you, where did you start? And tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, we'll, we'll rewind it way back. My journey starts pretty early, say, so, um and one of the things I always like to tell people is like, you, you've got to find that why that makes you cry. And it means you don't always have to cry, but, you know, you got to have that that meaning behind what you mm-hmm. do. And, it, you know, I don't know that I started in it with that meaning, but I figured it out. And so my story really starts when my dad passed away when I was eight years old and he did roofing and gutters and construction and is up on a roof. And, you know, it started to rain where we lived in Baltimore and then, you know, temperatures dropped and aluminum ladders freeze over faster than mm-hmm. a roof does. So he's coming down that after you know, basically a full day, finished up the job slipped and fell and was gone. And so that left my mom, and my sister and I right without a dad. And neither one of my parents graduated college and, you know, they ran this company together. Well, they're the exact people that need help from an insurance or financial advisor, but they never got that help. Right. And even to today, I, I, it's a little bit of a joke, but it's a serious one too. It's like, I never run into anyone that says, you know, I specialize, my niche is construction workers. I've still never heard that, right? Yeah, like, right, right, um, right. maybe there is one advisor, but they I still haven't right. run into them. People like that don't get advice. You know that, I know that. And even the basic thing of having term insurance there would have changed my parents, you know, my mom's life, my sure. life. And so she struggled through all those things. And uh, after, you know, really the breadwinner passed away. Mm-hmm. So that's like the origin story, right? So somewhere during all that trauma, 
a future retirement person was born, right? So that's, a, that's the backstory, right? You do a flashback. And how did I get into the industry? Well, I actually wanted to be in private equity. And that was my first job at a law school. So I went to Davidson for undergrad, great school. And Steph Curry's just lighting it up everywhere. Yeah. Um, I went to Villanova for law school. And I wanted to go to private equity. Very first job out, I went to Enovins Capital in Philadelphia, did chemical company acquisitions and got to work on some deal structure, legal document stuff for a while. And uh, so th that's in our world, but it's not our world, right? That's right, a different right. area of finance. And then eventually after that, I went and clerked in the appellate division. And this was a, kind of some formative stuff happened there. One, I got to work on some ERISA pension cases. So I started getting really into the laws around retirement plans, mm -hmm. gaining that knowledge, like further than just studying it in law school, but really spending time with the intricacies of these lawsuits. And then I also worked on one of Bernie Madoff's cases. So that's a big trigger moment in life too. Wow. And so you actually saw the opposite of what we wanted to see. You think about my origin story and this eight-year-old losing his parents and wishing there was an advisor there to be help. Then the first real advisor I ever run into from like a business world stance ends up being Bernie Madoff. Right? Wow. Wow. Yeah. One of the, one of the largest uh, Ponzi schemes or one of the largest uh -huh. uh, fraud schemes in the, in the world. Yeah. Right. And so you look at that and you say, well, why don't people like my mom trust financial professionals to get help? Well, yeah. it's the Bernie Madoffs of the world. So the fact that we still know Ponzi's name, right? That was a guy's name. We, right. we know his name, right? There's a lot of great CLUs and LUTCS. We never, we never learned their name, right? right? And they helped right. a lot of people. Yeah. And so what you see is our industry is not trusted. And it, it came to this whole thing like, wow, like how did this happen? And this is total abuse of trust. And in this profession, like trust is so key to what we do, though, too. Exactly. When I used to teach life insurance law, I said it's almost a fundamentally different transaction than any other transaction you'll have in your life. Because if you go, you go buy a book, you got a phone, you go to Chick-fil-A and buy a sandwich, you can walk back in and be like, hey, my sandwich is wrong. Like, give me a new sandwich, right? And Chick-fil-A would be like, absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. Here's right. your new sandwich, right? Um, and like the iPhone, same thing. Like, they'll send you a new one if it's broken. But if your life insurance or your plan breaks when you die, you, you can't walk back in there right. and say, hey, I need a new one. Right. Hey, this didn't go as right. I thought it was going to go. Right. So we have to trust that both like the companies, the strategies and the people will actually follow through with it. So I know that's a lot. And then, you know, into my own estate planning firm, I have my own consulting firm. I spent seven years at American College building out the RICP. And then I've been with Carson Group now for a little over four years. I really head up everything on the, the wealth solution side. but um, even though it's not out yet, uh, you know, my job's going to probably continuously evolve. I always tell people I, I don't think I've been in the same role here for nine months at any point. So I'm right get, getting pretty close to that other nine month period. So I'll probably be shifting a little bit in the future again. Sure, sure. So, 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 Jamie, what an impactful story, right? And, and you tell the story of your father and what it seeded in you was, was that you never wanted that to happen to someone else. And, and that's a powerful story. And I think if people out there who don't have a powerful story, you can leverage a financial professionals like Jamie's because it can happen to you. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to your clients. And it's our responsibility to serve those people who don't have a voice like your dad coming down the ladder, who didn't have a voice to say, hey, let me do this to protect my family. So, so that starts you out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, any mentors along the way that you say, man, you know, without this person, you know, I'm not sure why, I mean, you know, any mentors that you would say kind of have helped you along the way? There's probably too many to count. <laughs> so we want to really rewind it back. I've had a lot of great coaches, right? Like I played a lot of sports too. Um, not, not the same level as you, you know, I, I couldn't get up off the ground as high, but I, you know, I hopped on a diving board. I got pretty you high heard what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But, you know, I swam and Bob Bowman and uh, that probably had three really great swimming coaches and they weren't necessarily mentors at that level in the sense of your whole life, right. but like how you approach things, the discipline, building right. structure and systems so you could be successful. Like that was super important. Um, probably a couple of my mentors I had after actually um, Jim Meehan was a great mentor, 1847 Penn Mutual guy runs that division. Uh, right. He was probably the very first person I asked, like, hey, will you mentor me? Sure. Right. Um, I, up until that point, it's kind of the accidental ones. Uh, Judge Marie Lahats was f fantastic. Um, also, like without her, that, that's how I met my wife. And so three kids and wife wouldn't be there without her. And she was a great mentor in the sense of like kind of getting my personal life together so I could be yeah. more effective as yeah. 
you know, uh, somebody out like a whole person, right? Like that you can't just do work and you can't just be at home. Like you got to find that balance across everything. And so those were all really big mentors. And then Dave Littell at American College, I spent seven years with, and um, he was a great mentor. He was an Olympic fencer and, uh, you know, probably, I don't know, he's probably educated as many people in financial services as anyone who's ever been alive. So Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. he spent about 45 years at American College. Yeah. Yeah, you run those yeah. numbers out. So that's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. You know, Jamie, I have always said that, um, you know, your story, just in getting to know you over this over the last year, that your story is pretty interesting because the way in which you impact financial services is, is a little bit different. Right. Mm-hmm. So so you didn't grow up like many of us or many people that, that typically listen to a podcast with the idea of um, as a career agent in an insurance shop. Yeah. Right. And so. NAFI, I know, has a very heavy insurance um, following, yeah. right? And so with that being said, um, how did you come to be so connected to NAFI and mm-hmm. then so connected that you're actually sitting in a trustee's position to represent financial freedom from everybody? So tell us a little bit about how you you married what you were doing because you said mm-hmm. private equity those yeah. those that means there's a different different part of the balance sheet right how did you marry those things with the idea of partnering with the insurance mm-hmm. quote unquote uh um advocate yeah so like none of it's as super clean as you might want it to be right it's not like you know, I woke up one to say, and I looked out and I saw the CLU sign, the LUTCF sign. And I said, like, I want to go work with NAFA, right? Like, right, right. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, that doesn't that. happen. Yeah. Um, but no, what happened was, you know, there was a, I'd say, I'd say there was a lot of industry organizations that got along well with American College when I was there. So, you know, I, I think George Nichols is here, CEO and president too. So, yeah. strong historical connection. And at the time, actually, NAFA and American College had a, business arrangement too on the education side. So I did actually teach a little bit in that program. I would go out and talk to NAFA. A lot of the members also have other designations. So I, I kind of learned from the grassroots up, like literally it's the advisors and agents that I got to meet with them. Like, wow, they're doing really important stuff. And then what I realized at some point, you know, my my brief political background was that there's a huge like gaping hole out there on the advocacy side for a lot of the stuff. Like at American College, like, we didn't do any of that, right? We're education, we didn't do that. So I started paying attention more and more to what NAFA was doing there. I would come down here to some of the Hill meetings and like, I love that. So that's where I started getting involved there. And then part of it, right, we talk about it in the name, like we're, we're NAFA is supposed to represent, right, like Main Street all across the country, all these individuals and clients, including the financial advisor clients, not just insurance clients and not just product clients, right. but planning clients. Right. And so one of the asks, uh, you know, when the the, you know, the new president came in, was like, hey, let's bring in some of that outside of just insurance. But I kind of represent now today an interesting spot. When I joined Carson, somebody actually made this comment. They said, oh, the annuity guy, which is really funny because if you ask this world, they're like, oh, you know, the RIA guy. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but part of it is I didn't come into this industry and profession selling product. I wasn't in a producer role, right? right, right. I was in a different aspect of it. Right. And the good thing about that for me was I didn't come in with a lot of the built in biases that you develop once you're told like, hey, this is the best product go sell it right. wherever you sit, like mortgage wise, investment right. ETFs, mutual funds versus, you know, long term care, whole life. It like I didn't care. Like I was like, hey, they're all just products. And so right. I took this right. more like their solutions and we need to figure out which ones than the client needs. Right. And so I think that was super helpful for me, right? I've been an advocate for reverse mortgages, annuities, life insurance. I'm an advocate for some of the ETF technology that's been developed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I think I said it at Riskalyze conference, like, like I love products and I also don't care about them at all. Like right. I, I I don't care what the right. product's called, like the new, you know, the, the universal double life, right. extra special right. fees on top. Right. You know, like, yeah, doesn't care what that is. Right. With a long term care writer. Yeah, with a long term care writer. <laughs> with an LCC writer. Long term care writer. Critical care writer. Yeah. What, what's, um, so, 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 so you're able to see things, which is really interesting. You're able to see things from a, from a planning perspective, right? And then mm-hmm. you find the products either fit the solution or they don't, right? And you, because you didn't come in with a bias, you can see the positives and negatives to different products, yeah. right? And so I think we are 
unfortunately, we are biased yeah. because we came in learning all the wonderful things about insurance and didn't learn yeah. a lot about these other products because it might not have been in the financial best interest of the companies mm-hmm. in which we represented. Good, bad, or indifferent, yeah. right? So, so now that we 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 look at the world and it's it's different now, yeah. right? We have we have uh, career advisors, we've got broker independent brokers, mm-hmm. we've got financial planners, we've got fee only advisors, we've got and we've got so we got a series yeah. of we, we now we have bank coordinated mm-hmm. relationships. So we got so so how do we set ourselves apart? You know, yeah. how do you set yourself apart amongst all the chaos of everybody's doing? Everybody's in the, got their hand in the financial industry. From your perspective, what what would you say? What advice would you give a young advisor out there who came into the industry and said, "Look how crowded it is. Mm-hmm. How do I how do I create a name, a brand for myself that's unique yeah. in an approach, and I can approach it agnostically, so to speak?" Yeah, going forward, because that that is kind of the wave going forward. Yeah, man, you put a lot into that. That that that, that question had like thirteen different yeah, problems. layers, man. <laughs> Layers to this, but, man. Like onion or a cake. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, so we start to peel them back. So one of the first ones, like I don't want it to come across like I've got tons of biases. They just weren't product biases, right? right? right, um, right, right. But it, lots of them. And you know, I do think though that attorneys make really good. Um, you know, I don't know if I say financial planners. Maybe is probably the better one. But like they make really good planners because they're they're taught right? How to dissect things and challenge right. things. Right. And so I think that like me being an attorney coming in was beneficial. Now, if somebody's starting out today, we'll start with the brand question. So you are like this too, Chris, which is like, we both believe in brand and marketing and the growth that can come along with that, right? right? NAFA believes in that now too, that you have to promote your brand. You got to promote the brand of the people around you. Now, what I always told people, if you come in, I'd say, today I modified a little bit. I'll say, find your voice. And so that might be podcasts, it might be video, it might be Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, whichever medium you decide is your place, find your voice. I used to tell everybody to write, and I still do, but with more of a hesitation than before. A lot of the medium deliveries are still, you know, I think video is very strong today. Mm -hmm. I still think it's important to write down your thoughts because you're usually a much better speaker once you've written down right? And actually forced yourself to put that into a condensed format. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the best speakers out there, you know, they've written books, and then they're just kind of repeating what they've written down, but they've narrowed it in. So I tell everybody to write and find their voice. The next part is you don't have to have it all figured out when you start, like you didn't have it all figured out. I didn't. And it's okay to give yourself that permission that like, look, like you might, if you're running your own firm, you might change pricing 19 times. That's okay. Right? Like you don't have to get it right Right. the first time. Then the the other part, though, is like, how are you going to grow like this in the world today? And I think that we have to grow in different ways. Like, we can't just call our family and friends and ask them to become our clients and sell them insurance or manage their assets. So I don't I don't totally believe in like, well, I guess I, I go back and forth. I don't know if niche marketing is for everybody and niche planning is for everybody. For some people, it works really well. So right. one strategy is like, I want to work with doctors or I want to work with dentists or I want to work with young professionals. And you can pick an area and then you can get very narrow and you can deliver. I also think it's totally fine in this world to be like, hey, like I'll generally work with people who need help with planning. It's like a restaurant, right? Like I don't say like, I don't even want doctors coming to my restaurant. Like Mm -hmm. if I do really good food, anybody can come eat. If I do really good planning, anybody can come eat, right? right? Right. And so it depends on what you're delivering. Now, if you're delivering executive benefits, and that's what you focus on. Like, yeah, not everybody's a fit for you. Like my dad wasn't going to be a fit for you. Right. And that's okay. Sure. Um, but I think deciding that is important. And then do you want to serve the life cycle of the client or the client in a single moment in time? Right. And I'll be honest, not a lot of advisors, when I ask them that, are super clear on the answer. Right, right, right. But if you think from a business perspective, like most other businesses try to answer that question, right? right? And I think hmm. a lot of advisors don't answer it. And so you get a little bit murky when you pitch your services to people. Right. And right. it makes it harder for people to say yes, because they don't know exactly what the relationship is. Right, right, right. right. So, 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 so what I believe I heard you say yeah. is... Niches aren't for ever necessarily for everybody. It may be for some people, yes. Yeah. Um, but the idea that if you can the more granular you can get with your approach to the marketplace is the more easier it is for people to say, yes. Yeah, so there's mm-hmm. some work, there's some homework for, for everyone out there. 
is to ask yourself that question. Jamie, would you give it to us one more time? The question you ask to advisors is what? Yeah. And then they need to spend some time with that, right? Yeah. So the question you ask is like, do you want to serve a client across their whole life? So the life cycle of the client, or do you want to solve a problem at a single point in time? Right. Those are two very different relationships, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Like if a consultant comes to you, they're usually solving one problem and then they're gone, right? right. Like that's it. Right. And that's the business model. It is not, hey, every six months you come back to me, right? Mm -hmm. There's a different relationship. But a lot of advisors do both, but they don't think about it in those terms. And a lot of it's, you know, point of sale, sell. But how are you are you going to service them over the life cycle? Right. Or do you really treat that as a sale of a product? Then be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you actually look at data, there's this a survey that was done called the value of advice. And in that, though, clients are happier when they know the difference up front, both how somebody's compensated and the relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the like, oh, it's some esoteric conversation. No, the data actually backs up that clients are happier in those situations. And regardless of which situation they end up in, right. the, the argument is not that one is better than the other. And the same thing with a lot of compensation models. Clients don't care about it as much as long as they know what it is up front. Right, right. And as long as they know that, they become happier. They become more likely to refer somebody else to you for right. just, just the selfish business growth aspect. The clearer you can be up front, the more the client's going to enjoy it and mm -hmm. the more you're going to get referrals. Mm -hmm. So, so, so. There's a lot of layers to that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, tune in. Jamie has his own podcast. He's he's mm -hmm. he's 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 out there. Um, Google framework. Jamie, Jamie, framework is yeah. the name of it. Um, Google Jamie Hopkins. He's got a ton of good stuff. Um, fellow NAFA member. Um, we're gonna get into kind of you know Jamie's taking a different journey. Um, one of the things he's did, you know, he's on his second book, and yeah. we want to talk a little bit about that. We've got it here. Finding your freedom. Uh, but we want to talk a little bit about his first book that led him to writing his second book. Mm -hmm. um, Jamie also was behind the RICP mm -hmm. at American College. Yeah. So I asked the question, I said, you know, Jamie, what 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 designation should I get next? And he's like, the RICP. And I said, well, why? You know, and tell me why you said that. Uh, so actually, that gets to that granular level, right? Like retirement income is one of the key things that most people are looking for in a financial service professional relationship, right? right? They eventually want to know that they're going to be okay in retirement. Right. So to me, I always say like, you know, I wouldn't hire a surgeon to perform surgery on me that didn't go to med school. I wouldn't hire an attorney to represent me in court that didn't go to law school. Right. Right. Would you hire somebody to manage your retirement that didn't study it? Right. And so to me, right. yeah, we should study it, right? And so that's the key thing for me there is like, I'm education. I think advisors need to learn it. Two, there are a lot of clients looking for that expertise skill set now. So having those letters also says, hey, look, I've dedicated myself to this. But if you don't work in that space, then then don't get it, right? Get a CLU or an LUCCF. Like everybody doesn't have to be in that space. You can be in it. There's exit planner designations now. Like maybe that's the, the space you want to be right, in. Right. Uh, but that's why I talk about uh, RICP. It's also built correctly. Like from an educational standpoint, we we did a lot of interviews. It wasn't just like, let me let me Jamie tell you how smart I am. Right. And so I'm gonna go right. over a bunch of stuff. Like we had just fantastic people in there, a bunch of NAFA members, you know, Tom Hagen is in the program, Curtis Cloak, a bunch of people uh, on this show that you've probably seen before yeah. too. We call them the Mount we put them on the, the Mount Rushmore of yeah. financial services, right? If you had to build the bet, you know, the, the the dream team, right? Those are two guys that that name recognition, right? Mm -hmm. They've done a great job at marketing themselves, they've done yeah. a great job as is transcending knowledge to others and making it dialing it back to yeah. you know no one's as smart as those guys but they're they're smart in their own way and and again everything is borrowed and repurposed so we're able yeah. to repurpose some of the things or at least some of the techniques that they use to be able to work with work with clients but you didn't say it for that reason you also told me you said well you know i actually help help I, actually I help write that thing yeah and so here's a really interesting thing this summer that occurred too is uh somebody asked me what my brand was and i said well it's probably like the retirement guy and i got my little cards i do on linkedin and stuff yeah. but the funny thing about all of that now is like that's all kind of like it's all like the secondary stuff so when you talk about the program people think about like oh i designed content for it but yeah like what we did is we built a program up from scratch we got a compliance approved we ran the business case for it i went and sold that thing to I mean, I probably did 200 days on the road the first year that that thing came wow. out. I was at every big company out. I mean, you know, the the nationwide, the Thrivance, and Amer you know, American Funds, like basically anybody who was in this industry, we were out on the road trying to get them to adopt it. 
And so really what I did that those first couple of years is right, we ran a new business, right? We scaled up a new offering, research the program, build all of it, the content, delivered it. And by the time I left there, um, I was there for about, I guess, six years with the program up and running, about seven years total. Um, we had put about 18,000 financial service professionals through the RICP in six years, right? That's basically the totality of NAFA. It'd be every single NAFA member today wow. going through a program. Wow. Think about that. Wow, that's pretty um, impressive. Yeah. So that's it's more than anybody went through any other program like CFP, CLU, LUTCF. Like we just kind of dwarfed all of them in that six year period. And so that was really impressive, right? We scaled up a great program, delivered a lot of value. And that's kind of what I, you know, and then that that led me to Rewirement, which was my first book. And the first book was all about retirement income planning in the process. And then the behavioral hurdles we have to shift from that accumulation phase to decumulation right, right, from right. savings and risk and, you know, survivor bias, all of those things and how they impact our planning. And so that was book one. And that did that did better than I thought it was. Like I went into that saying, I'll, I'll probably won't sell a single one of these, right? Like none, but I'm going to hand them out of conferences when I go and talk. And they'd like people will get my book. Well, I got a bunch of bulk orders through that one. And it turned out like I probably I probably did like make a hundred bucks eventually, right? Like, you know. <laughs> now I think I sold about twenty thousand copies of rewirement. So it's a, in the book world, it's actually pretty good. Nice. Now um, it's called rewirement. You can get it on Amazon. Yeah. It's out there. Um, yeah. And I told Jamie, if he was coming on our podcast, if you send it to him, he has to at least sign it. I will sign it. Yeah. No, I, I still have a couple. Sometimes people paint. So this is funny. Like, I, I guess this probably happens to every author, but I'll get random people that'll just ping me and be like, hey, can you send me a copy of your book? Right. And I'm like, you know, like it does cost me something. <laughs> like, it's like 10 bucks to print it and six to ship it out to you. That's all. So I, I've, probably, I've probably sent 200 out just from people asking. Um, yeah, and then I wrote the new book here, which you can pre-order now or order for November 22nd, Find Your Freedom. And one of my big goals, get it on New York Times bestseller list. Sure. So help 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 me out. That's why Chris helped me out too. Sure. But uh, yeah, so I wrote that one. It went better than I thought. I wrote this one uh, this past year, uh, published with Harriman House and coming out. I, I wrote three textbooks in my life too, and two eBooks for Forbes. But this is probably the first one I'd say I like I really put my story into. Um, the other ones, like you don't put your story into a right, textbook. Like right, nobody right. wants to hear about like when I talked about my dad or my my sister being sick or any of those things. So this is really the first time I've kind of put my story into a planning book. Mm -hmm. I would also say there aren't very many planning books out there. I asked this question before I wrote it last year, and this is where it came from, which was I said, hey, like, what's your best, what's your favorite financial service book? And all the answers were the rich dad, poor dad. How do I invest my money? Right. right? Millionaire next door. They're all investment right. books, right? right? right. Like, right. they're not planning books. And so I kind of set out to hopefully write the best planning book that's ever been written today. And then hmm. somebody else will write a better one than me. And then somebody's going to write a better one than that. And then this will be the worst planning book ever written in like 10 <laughs> years, but it'll be the first best one. Right. right, right. <laughs> well, they, they say that someone has to has to be first. Yeah. So if someone has to be first, we're going to hope it's a NAFA member like Jamie Hopkins. So so get Jamie's book, find finding your find your freedom. It'll be out. Let's make him uh, if you can see it. Let's make him the, um, uh, you know, a world, a, a world renowned author. And let's yeah. let's get him on the New York Times bestseller. Jamie, how many how many books does our audience need to order to make that happen? <laughs> Yeah, if, if we, we order like 10,000 of these, we'll be in a good spot. 10, so, yeah. So, so, so if everybody orders at least 50 for distribution <laughs> for their clients, I mean, oh, if man. you think about yeah. that, right? If everyone out there orders 50, um, we can give them to our clients. Yep. Um, our, we can make them as a part of our sales process when we're working with someone in retirement planning. Yeah. And, and we get a chance to do two things. One, we get a chance to help promote the message, a well-renowned message. And we know it's 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 insurance friendly. So we get a chance to actually promote that and we get a chance to give our clients something that we can actually teach them through. Yeah. Right. So 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 we give them an actual playbook. Yeah. To kind of to, to try to try and a story and a story behind. Yeah. It. So I'll give you two really cool things about this, too. The way that we wrote the book was um, with Harriman House, which is why we ended up landing on them, is the advisors um, that we have at Carson actually will be able to write the forward to it. So they'll actually be able to hand this out to their clients with forward by Chris Handy and hand it out to their clients. And Very I nice. think that's going to be super cool. Um, but that's not available yet for our partners. We want to get it on New York Times first, and then it'll be New York Times book, and you can hand it out. Um, and the other really cool thing is like that's already started to happen. So Fairway, which will give us a you know, shout out to one of the NAFA sponsors, right. and 
got to usually have a good amount of fairway listeners, I'm guessing, out there too. Yeah. Uh, great sponsor, great partner of NAFA. They went ahead and bought a whole bunch to hand out to their clients and prospects. And Asset Map, who's another sponsor here with us today, they yeah. did the same thing. So yeah, feel free to do that. And then Tyrone Ross, um, a great financial advisor out there, started out in this space too. Um, his firm just bought a bunch to, to hand out to some of their clients too. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good thing. Um, you know, I think if we if we said everybody went out and read a financial planning book, like wouldn't we be pretty happy in the financial service space? Right. I think we'd be pretty happy. Right. <laughs> well, we're gonna go out. You know, Midwest Legacy, our firm, we'll buy we'll buy some and yeah. make sure we support you and in your in your journey as you continue to to impact NAFA, impact the members, and provide provide great value. I know everybody out there, you know. Um, you know, they, you know, many people I've talked to kind of deem you the kind of the whiz kid, kind of the kid, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, because Jamie, Jamie's, Jamie, Jamie is, oh. is from a, from an experience perspective, you would think he's 60, right? Oh. But, but Jamie, how old are you? I, I feel like 60 now. We, we did a run yesterday and it hurt, man. You yeah. know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm 37 now, but I, I graduated college when I was 21. So I've got, you know, I now have 16, what, that's 16 years. 16 um, years. So it's, it, that's the, the other funny thing. We go to like the young, uh, you know, advisor stuff now, and I'm a decade older than the next right. oldest right. person right. there, which is great to see. Right. Right? You're, you're the old man. Yeah, I feel <laughs> old now. So, so you're the old man. Well, Jamie, um, thank you for the time. Is there anything else you want to share with with uh, at the national leadership conference that uh, you would like to share about yourself, your book, your journey? Um, and or to NAFA members uh, before we get to what I call the speed round. The speed okay, round's speed kind round. of fun. Right. So speed well, round's uh, fun. Well, I'll, I'll give three things. I like things in three. So number one is if you haven't been to National Leaders Forum or if you don't come to the congressional meeting, I'd say come to come to those. Come to DC, get involved. Like it's the uh, I think it's one of the best things you can do in this entire industry, not just NAFA wide. But like in the whole industry, has come down here. I mean, getting to meet with your senators and House reps. Uh, that adds credibility to your clients and like define the world that you want to live in. Don't let it define you. So I think that's one. Um, the the energy here is always nice, right? Like that. Like that's another part too. I I love the 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 talk about the huddle and you know taking care of your team. Right. Like that was right. a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. Like are you taking care of your team? So I think that's a big message. A lot of people are burnout right now. So when you look around your team, you know you have a lot of leaders on this. Are you taking care of your team today? Right. And you need to do something different to make sure that they're okay. Uh, and then the last part is, you know, I'd also, you know, that we have that the name of the book, Find Your Freedom, but start asking people that question, like, what does freedom mean to you? Um, like, I, that's Leonard was talking about it when he was uh, uh, up on stage here that he's like, I was talking to Jamie and I kept pushing on him last night. It's like, well, what does freedom mean to you? What does freedom, right. You know, we had a really cool conversation about that. So I'd love to hear your answer on that, right? Like, I'm the guest, but I run my own show too. So I can ask yeah, that's kind of right? cool, right? Yeah. What does freedom mean to you, Chris? So, um, you know, without having some some deep thought and really putting together words that mean something to me, um, I would simply say it's the ability to choose. Yeah. For me, it's the ability to choose and transcend my previous thoughts. Okay. So 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 the ability to choose for me gives me the opportunity to change things. Yeah. And the ability to to know that my last thought isn't as good as my next thought, mm -hmm. I think allows for me to start to really think like this yeah. versus think linear. Right. And so um, I joke all the time because my staff is always like, OK, we're good where we are. And I said, if we're good where we are, we've only just began to scratch the surface mm -hmm. of our of our opportunity and what we're capable of. Yeah. You know, um, the word that I've always heard in sports, and I'll relate it to, to financial services as a sport, is potential. Mm -hmm. And you hear someone's not living up to their potential. And, and it, it, typically, they are living up to their potential. They're just not living up to 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 what others pe other people's yeah. expectation is of their potential mm -hmm. right and so their their ability to be able our ability to be able to think and be able to really understand where we came from and what motivates us every day when no one else is watching i think that allows for us to really put some arms some 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 umbrella around that freedom concept and again, it means something different to everybody. But for me, yeah. it means not being poor again. You know, that's that's my <laughs> that's choice. That's part of it too. Yeah, that's part of choice, man. 
Yeah, no, that's it. That's beautiful. And yeah, it's it. That's the thing is it's different for everybody. And it's, it's an interesting, it's not just like, how are you doing? What do you want to be in the future? Right, like, right. it's just the language is different. And like, to me, it's similar. Like, I want to be able to wake up and design my day. That's it. Like, right. that's what that's what it means. And I don't have that today. Um, I tell people like, I wrote a whole book about finding your freedom, but like, I don't feel free yet. Um, but I know what I'm doing to get there. Right. And right. I think it's about that journey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, luckily I also have Ron Carson around me. He's much more free on the free scale. When we talk, like I'm over here at like a three or four, Ron's like a 10, he's got a plane, he's flying around. Like, you know, he's, he started the business in 83 selling insurance out of his dorm room, but he's found that freedom now, you know, 40, right. 40 years later. <laughs> right. right. So, so, so for you and I, yeah, I don't want it to take that long. You yeah. know, I, 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 don't, I don't want it to, I don't want to take that. Long. I mean, seriously, yeah. like, so, so, so the people that are listening to this podcast, the whole idea is that. We want to be able to move to mediums and be able to understand that we don't have to, you know, time is nothing more than an element mm-hmm. of experience, right? And so we 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 think based on the way we were raised that time is the, the integral part of success. Yeah. But if we look up the definition of success, time is not in there. No. <laughs> right. It's not in the definition at uh-huh. all. So if we're able to now say, I don't want it to take that long. Like I said, I wanted to be the CEO of my firm by the age of 30. Yeah. People were like, oh, yeah, I'm right. Blah, 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 blah. So no, no one hired me as a CEO. So on my 30th birthday, I created it. Yeah. I literally filed the papers for an LLC, didn't know what the hell we were going to do. Yeah. Right. But I knew yeah. that I knew I had a concept in my head of kind of what I wanted to create. Yeah. And we created a group called Apex Consulting Group, which was basically everything I learned about the business of sports. Mm as a concierge service that I knew my agent didn't have the capability of bringing me. That's awesome. Right. So I, I started that great cons, great concept, really brought it out to players and it really was a, a good idea. But the idea was simple. I wanted to be able to say, I said I was going to do something and I did, did it, it regardless of if I was prepared or ready yet. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, that's a big part of about finding you, you know, the, the comment that you made about the book, mm-hmm. which is, Again, finding your freedom. Go get it. Um, when does it come out, Jamie? Uh, November 22nd. So no, the no, Tuesday this week, right? Yeah. So by the time you hear this, <laughs> it will be out. Yeah. Go get you go some get copies. It. Go yeah. order it for your clients for Christmas. But you have a word in there, finding. Yeah. So that means we're on a journey. It is. Because that that, that journey is continuous. Yeah. Right? And it's uh, for the rest of your life. And I've had some really interesting conversations about that. Like, does anybody actually get to a 10? Or are you always at a nine when you're free striving for something more? Right. Right. right? And like, right. that's a really interesting concept. Um, the other thing is, uh, so I was at a the Schwab Impact Conference and we had that up there and somebody came by and said, oh, so you're selling freedom. And I said, no, it's even better. We're going to help you find it. Right. Yeah. What about this <laughs> Yeah, and they were like, "That's pretty deep." Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah, you yeah. can't just you, you can't, can't just say you can't just say, "Well, wait a minute, wait a minute." Like I thought I was coming at you with a curveball, yeah, yeah, but you just hit me with a slider yeah. and knife. <laughs> That's good. So, um, but yeah, like you know, I, I've got some huge goals, you know, in my world, and you know, some of them I have to redesign. Like I, I said at one point, like I want to help make retirement more secure for a million Americans. And like when I tell people that, they're like, "Wow, like that's crazy! Like that's a big goal." And I was like, "Yeah, I think I hit that when I was 30. Four years old, right? Hmm. Thirty-four. Okay, so like I need to come up with a bigger goal, now. right? And right, I, you right. know, like I, I don't think it's just upping the number, uh, but that's all I've done so far. Right. right now, I'm like a hundred million. <laughs> like that's 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 the next one, right? But uh, you know, and like I, I've always listed that. Like I want to be, a, I, I had it listed. I want to be a CEO by forty. So you know, yes, I'm, I'm thirty-seven. So if anyone's listening, you know, and they they call Ron and say, hey, we want Jamie, you know. But uh, Ron knows that too. I talk about it a lot with him. And like, that's one of my goals, right? Like I want to run something. The title's actually not as important to me, but like, I know I want to run it like top to bottom. Right. And right. You know, I have my own consulting and estate planning firm, but I mean, it was me. So like I was the best and worst boss ever, right. you know, at the right. same time. Right. <laughs> we'll run through the speed round, Jamie. All Thank right. you for your time. Um, everyone out there, Jamie Hopkins, come check him out. Um, he's a Na- loyal NAFA member. Also, check out his book, Find Find Your Freedom. It's out, it'll be out there on Amazon. Um, reach out to Jamie. Also, Jamie will give you his email. You can reach out to him if you want to buy bulk. I don't know how the bulk process is going, but at yep. the end, we can, we can talk about that. Let's go to the speed round. We'll hurry through this. So, so Jamie, here we go. So the goal of the speed round is whatever comes to mind first, mm-hmm. that's what it is, right? So, yeah. so there's not a lot of deep thought. And so, <laughs> you know, we'll see what we're we'll see what happens here. So, 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 so Jamie, um, you ready? 
So we'll start off with what's your favorite color? Green. Okay, see, so that how easy that was? Yeah, okay, so let's good. go. All right, so Jamie, we're in DC, so we're gonna have a little fun with DC. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So what's your favorite place here in DC to visit? Uh so my favorite place is the 930 Club. It's a music venue. And okay. I've seen a lot of really good acts there. Okay, so the 930 Club. Okay, yeah. sounds like a great opportunity. The most memorable time you've had in DC. Uh most memorable time I've had in DC. Um, it was there. So I got to I guess we got to meet Ben Harper and I actually became friends with his bass player who him and I actually jammed together for uh, you know a couple of different times later on. So that that was really cool. OK, yeah. so favorite kind of music, Jamie. What about that? Yes, yeah, so I'm a metal guy, um, which uh, I haven't flown that. But that's my that's my answer is metal. And I also love Lito's Pizza here in D.C. So shout out to Lito's Pizza. <laughs> so um, favorite sports team. Yeah. Um, that's tough right now. Uh, it used to be the Washington football team. I got to say right now, they're, they're not my favorite team. So I got to go with Notre Dame. Then right now, Notre Dame football is going to be number one. And then for all our NAFA members to date, your most proudest experience as a, as a, as impacting or being in the financial services. Industry. That's a good one. So I do know what it is. Um, and I wasn't there for it. So that's an interesting thing. I helped connect a woman who was a widow to an advisor, and then they ended up working with the advisor. And I know when they signed the paperwork and moved their accounts, she just cried. And she said, like, I didn't think I was going to find somebody that understood me. Hmm. And that, you know, I eventually you know, got the story. It wasn't there. But that one was super impactful because, like, that's probably the closest thing to, to my mom's story coming back, hmm. right, where you know, without my existence in there, that person wouldn't have went to an advisor. They wouldn't have then found another woman advisor that they felt connected to. That's a great advisor, Abby Henderson. Um, just fantastic. It does all the right things. And like, that one's probably it, right? And like, that's the small story. I mean, I know I have to do a lot of things to be able to make that happen. Sure. But that that's a pretty beautiful story. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jamie Hopkins. Um, let's go out and support our NAFA, our NAFA trustee, Jamie Hopkins, on uh, Finding Your Freedom. His book is out. His first book was... Rewirement, but that's okay. Then we don't, we're going to order two books. Come on, but Rewirement's out there. Rewirement's out. It's been out a little bit of time. If you haven't read the first one, doesn't mean you can't read the second one. You can read the second <laughs> one first if you choose to. Yeah. Listen, let's go out and support Jamie. Thanks, Jamie, for being here at the National Leadership Conference, where you lead by example, you lead by inspiration, and we're so proud to have you as a member Thank all of you for tuning in to Advisor Today's podcast, where we support each other, uplift each other for the education and empowerment for the future of what the industry looks like. And we represent the voice of those in Main Street today. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. God bless. We'll see you next week um, on to Advisor Today's podcast. Thank you. Thank you, everybody at NAFA. Thanks for joining us for NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.